Hello, good evening, welcome. I might be a few minutes early starting, but I've got one or two announcements to make, so uh, um, it's warm. We don't want to be, uh, we, we don't want to be cooking. Uh, as I said earlier, it's a good, uh, it's a good room for breeding germs or something. Uh, in no particular order, um, I'll first of all apologise for the chaos tonight. It is sorted for the future. Um, meetings uh, will continue to be held here, but we've just sorted out the car parking. You. Uh, will be able to park in the car park outside as usual. The people who are, u who are using the gym uh, will go around the back and park in the playground. Right. So um, next month we return to normal, hopefully. But uh, I didn't find out about this until uh, about half past three this afternoon. So there wasn't a lot we could do about it in the short term, apart from send out an email and let you know there was a problem and it looks as if you all got the email because you're all here. There we go. No need to say any more, apart from the fact that I need to change my glasses, otherwise I won't be able to read what's on this bit of paper. As they always say, nothing wrong with the eyesight, the arms aren't long enough. But there we go. Right. Uh, the first thing I've been given is um, Menai Bridge Book Fair. Uh, books, old and new, English and Welsh, postcards, collectibles, records, CDs, etc. Um, entrance one pound, Uskull David Hughes School, uh, on a small Anglesey, and that's Saturday the 12th of October, 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. I'll leave it on the table. If anybody wants to uh, make a note of it later, wonderful. Uh, if you uh, paid your membership subscription in 2018-19, then uh, you'll probably remember that we made an announcement and said that uh, you're free until uh, May next year because it's the 10th anniversary of the society. So we were giving everybody a freebie. It wasn't buy one, get one free. It was get one free. So there we are. I noticed that some people have responded to, re to the request for hardback books. I've no idea what we're going to do with them, but uh, it's for the, uh, the Christmas tree um, festival that takes place in St. Mary's Church. Strangely enough, because it's a Christmas, it takes place at Christmas. Uh, so thank you for those who brought book, uh, books in. Uh, I think we're doing okay. Right. Um, I always, uh, I always sort of have a, have a flashback. Tonight's flashback takes us back to 1777. General George Washington and his troops are defeated by the British under General Sir William Howe at the Battle of Brandywine. That sounds good, doesn't it? Brandywine. Yeah? Whether that was a battle or a booze up, I don't know. But anyway, the Battle of Brandywine. And that Brandywine's in Pennsylvania. So there you go. Uh, oh, he was there, was he? Oh, well, fine. Well, there we go. I thought you had a good memory there. For a <laughs> and of course, um, today is 9-11, and we don't need reminding about 9-11. It's a question of where was I at 9-11. Me, personally, I was in Tesco's car park in Malta. Um, you remember these things, don't you? Yeah. So, uh, moving swiftly on to another piece of paper. I can find it. Well, there were two pieces of paper when I came out. They've stuck rather well together. Look at that. Quality of paper. Very thin. So, uh, moving on to tonight, the first of uh, the new season of um, lectures uh, with the... Um, Rutland Local History Society, uh, our speaker is Michael Blackburn. Uh, he's travelled from his home in San Vervec and he came the pretty route because you've probably seen you. that uh, yeah. there were problems on the A55 at San Vervec. <coughs> so um, he's uh, come over the top. Uh, in the same way that I used to travel when I used to go down 
in that direction, but they were constructing the A55. Turned out to be far quicker in the end. Anyway, he's come from his home in Clan uh, and he also tells me that uh, his Welsh family is from the Vale of Clwyd. Michael worked for the Ordnance Survey for some 40 years, where he gained much of his knowledge for his long and still growing lecture list. Michael's subject tonight is the canalisation of the rivers Clwyd and Dee. Ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome Michael Blackburn. I'm glad you mentioned my family in the Vale of Clwyd because my family originates from Nant Glyn. Oh, yeah. That lovely little village hidden away up the, what's the river? The Aladisav that bypasses Denby like a moat, a sneaky little river that hides away and eventually joins the River Clwyd. Uh, near Clwenny, which you all know about, I hope. Clwenny, yes. Um, and the reason I mention it is because before I start this talk, I've done a lot of history study of the Vale of Clwyd. I even do guided photo drive tours through the Vale of Clwyd um, with many different groups all over North Wales. Um, but something that really interested me, and I found this out a few years ago, um, do you all know about the current Welsh flag with the dragon on it? Not a Chinese dragon. Do you know why it's got such close links with the Vale of Fluid? Right. In the late 1700s, when you were just talking about, a young chap called Robert Davis, who became eventually, well he, he was a number of things, but his main task he had for part of his life was a butcher. He was very successful in I. Steadfords, and he won a number of Bardic chairs, and in, nine, uh, 19, in 1812 13, so the Napoleonic Wars are still taking place, a committee was decided to be brought together. Now, the strange thing is, when you read these histories, and it's all on the internet, the majority of the committee came from Liverpool. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. And if you look at a map of the Dingle in Liverpool, most of the streets have got Welsh names because it had a very large Welsh community. So a decision had been made that they wanted to organise nationalised Steadfords more unified and annually across the whole of Wales. And Robert Davis from Nant Glyn, because he'd won a number of Bardic seats, had been chosen to be on the committee. By 1818, they had decided how they were going to run the future of the nationalised Steadford. And nowadays we'd say, we need a logo, we need advertising. Now, a dragon had appeared on a number of other types of flags. But up to that day, that flag that we see today hadn't been decided upon. And it was Robert Davis who made a suggestion at a committee meeting, held in Bod Ferry, <laughs> believe it or not, that the flag should represent the Welsh landscape in winter, covered in snow, white, in summer, green. There's the background. And he made the suggestion that from an original plume of feathers with a small dragon on, the big dragon we know today should be on the flag. But it was created so that the nationalised stead for each year would have something to represent it, whether it was North Wales, South Wales, or in Liverpool. And that's the background to the flag. <coughs> but what's also interesting is, he was a close friend, Robert Davis, of another person from Nantlin, and I find these stories amazing. A chap you may have heard of called David Samwell. He was the son of the vicar in Nant Glyn during that period of time. And eventually, after training in Liverpool, uh, he went to school in Rithin, after training in Liverpool, and eventually with the Admiralty in Southampton and Dartmouth, he became a surgeon for the Royal Navy on sailing ships. Right? And I love this story, because we're talking little sleepy Nant Glyn. He ended up on the third voyage around the world 
with Captain Cook. He was the surgeon on his ship Resolution. And what I love about this, and I, I can't show you all, but I will show your chairperson here so he can see. When they were trying to find a route through the Bering Straits, that's between Russia and Alaska, they anchored at two places. One was a cove on the coast. And David Samwell from Nantglin named the cove Cape Denby. <laughs> Can you see it on there? No, oh, I can't wrong that. All oh, right, it's there. He also named, it had been suggested by another crew member, because there were Welshmen on board, he also named the Prince of Wales Sound. That's in the Bering Strait. But more importantly than that, a Welshman from the Vale of Cluid named the first coastal community on the Alaska side on the Bering Strait. And what's it called? It's called Wales. Oh. I bet you didn't know that, did you? A Welshman from the Vale of Cluid named a place on the fast reaches of the USA, Alaska, Wales. Now, of course, Wales is in the news on and off at the moment because the Russians, the Americans and the Chinese, who never get on, are talking about building a tunnel under the Bering Strait and it's going to come ashore if they do it in Wales. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Right, just before I start the talk, I just want to read you something else because I think this is very important and I mentioned this to you when I was here before. Um, I'm looking in the archaeology of Cluid, but this is also on the internet and it's in lots of other places. Advertising brochures here for Denbyshire talk about this subject often because Cardiff University and Nottingham University are constantly doing work in Bontnair with Cave at Kevin, the other side of St Asaph. If you've been there, you'll notice it's all bricked up and it's got a, an iron door on it. Nobody can go in there, but you can go in with a guide and have a look. And I just want to quote this because I think it's very important. When we talk this area, and you're sitting on the edge of the Cluid Delta, I hope you realise that. If it wasn't for tidal banks between Prostatin and Pensarn, you would be all right here in Ridland, but the rest of the valley would flood on high tides every month. That's a fact. You can't get away from that. But I just want to give this quote to you because I love this, all right? Bontnewith Cave has been excavated now for a period of about 140 years. And what they're doing is they're slowly stripping the floor layers away. And they're finding more and more results from their excavations. And this is just a list. They have found human remains in that cave. They've been dated. 230,000 years old. Did you say a nasty word there? <laughs> Just put that into context. When the majority of us, if we're lucky with our health, live 70, 80, 90, a few make it to 100, but 230,000 years ago, human remains are there. They're probably not standing up then like we do. But this is what's also being found, and I just think this is so important, because I would imagine this whole area away from the delta was dense woodland, forest, and they found remains in that cave of wolves, bears, leopards, saber-toothed tigers, origins of original old types of horses, rhinoceros, Voles, roe deer, beavers, bison, <coughs> hyena, wild cattle, and a Norway lemming, which still exists in Norway today. Now that's very important. I've got you together as a historical group, and I think it's great to go back to the basics. The oldest human remains that have been found on the planet so far are in a cave in Morocco. They're dating back 330,000 years. So that's 100,000 years older than our own ones on our own doorstep. I'd just like to remind people about that. You know? The modern generation, under the age of 30, thinks the world's always been covered in cars and aeroplanes and mobile phones. They don't think there was another life before all that, so it's quite interesting. Right, okay, we're going through pictures. 
You're the right chap. I asked this lady, but she prefers to relax, okay? Can you press a button for me as we go? Are you happy to do that? Yes. Right. Just press the green button when I say it. Okay, so we're looking at two rivers um, that you both should know. You should know both rivers reasonably well. Um, maybe the D you only know at Chester and maybe flying across it uh, when you go on the Queen's Ferry Bypass. But I put this old map up to start off with. This is very famous. It was a parchment map that was discovered in the Bodleian Library in Oxford in about the 1890s. It was in a type of wooden tube, but it was in a pretty bad state, and nobody had ever bothered opening it. And a Professor Guff, who was working in Brasenose College at the time, said, let's have a look. So they undid this wooden tube, pulled this parchment out, and it proceeded to explode into thousands of little pieces. He spent 20 years piecing it together. What I've done is I've just photographed the section of us. Now, I've turned it. This is the North Wales coast here. Here's the coastline from Liverpool going up to Preston, up to Morecambe that way. The important thing is, he managed to date. It's a sketch map. It's a scribbled map. And he's done the translations and names on there. It's in like an early type of Saxon, Celtic language, whatever. Um, and he's done the translations as well as he can do. It's an ecclesiastical map. So that's very relevant to here. Because the oldest cathedral that's been continually used in the British Isles is Bangor. Second to it is St. Asaph. Right, Bangor dates back to 525 AD. There is one that's older than that, and that's Whithorn in Galloway, up near Cucubri, up that way, southern Scotland. Whithorn is a ruin, but that dates back to about 330 AD. But what's important about this is it shows the gatherings of ecclesiastical centres. But for us, it's got the rivers on here. And the rivers are correct in relation to each other. Here's the Cluid with its main tributary, the Elwy. Here's the Conwy with its tributaries coming from Snowdon, the Porcupine in the middle, and off the Denby Moors. Uh, the Seant is on here, coming out to Carnarvon. And we've got Anglesey, and it's quite interesting. The date he prescribed to it was 1325. So it's really after. Edward I has come in and started to conquer Wales and control, but I think it's really funny because they've got Beaumaris where Holyhead is. <laughs> <laughs> and Puffin Island is off the beach at Rill. <laughs> so it's a classic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah? And there's the River Dee, obviously the longest river in North Wales. Okay, next picture. So I've just put an image on of Bangor Cathedral because I think it's very important. If you don't know this history, you should do. If you're Welsh born and bred, you should know this as well. In the nave, in the church, in the cathedral, is a burial tablet. And it's Owen Gwynedd's tablet. The forerunner of the Princes of Gwynedd. He's buried. Probably not now because it's been rebuilt many times. But what you're looking at is the changes to the cathedral from the mid-1800s to do with Sir George Gilbert Scott. But the other tower that's not visible, the altar area, some of that stonework there dates back to 525. So it's the oldest continually used cathedral church in the whole of the UK. And of course in five years time it celebrates 1,500 years old. Wales. It's not Lincoln in England or York Minster or Wells or Westminster Abbey. It's here on our own doorstep. Okay, next picture. And a little bit about me very quickly. As mentioned by your chairman, uh, I've been an Ordnance Survey surveyor for well nearly 40 years, but I've done a lot of other work linked to the Ordnance Survey since I retired. In 1991, the Ordnance Survey was 200 years old. And I think this is the thing that's important for historians. They started making maps of the south coast of England from 1791 onwards. It was a department of the, or the army, the Royal Ordnance, and the idea was to have detailed maps 
of um, Suffolk, Essex, Kent, round to um, Sussex, excuse me, Sussex, to protect us, help protect us from invasion from Napoleon. That was the start of the Organ Survey. By 1827, virtually the whole country had been surveyed at a scale of six inches to the mile, and large areas of conurbations have been surveyed at 25 inches to the mile. So we are the most surveyed, mapped country in great detail in the whole world. Of the 222 named countries on the planet at the moment, we have better mapping than any of those other countries. Next picture. And just to show that I did do it, <laughs> that's me with very, well, a bit of grey hair coming. That's on the top of the little lawn uh, in the days of using theodolite. That's so historic and out of date now. Of course, GPS has changed everything. But in those days, we're on an Ordnance Survey triangulation pillar. You had to have what we call control points to work from. Nowadays, you don't need that anymore. Yes, um, but there we are. That just goes to show what I did for 40 years. Okay, next picture, please. So, we come to the first river, and I'm focusing on the Cluid first. And of course, the Cluid, I hope you know your river. <coughs> Do you all know where it starts? Oh, oh good. Well, <laughs> Some people don't remember. <laughs> yes, it starts in the southern area of the Klokinog Forest, and it's like a letter J. It curves round into Rithin, obviously up the Wide Vale, and eventually to the sea at Rill. According to Philip Evans's detailed map of North Wales, dated 1796, the river didn't enter the sea at Rill. There was a massive grey stone and sand bund that reached along to where Prostatin is. The river entered the sea opposite Prostatin. But the other thing that's important as well, linked to the river, before we go into the canalisation, yes. is, of course, North Wales has got a fantastic collection, gathering, and still most of them are visible of ancient monuments right across North Wales. Here is highlighted the hill forts, on the Cluid Hills, and of course Paniclodii is the second largest acreage of a hill fort, an Iron Age hill fort in the UK. Uh, so you've got a lot of history <coughs> right on your own doorstep. Next one please. And then we have to mention, because they've had the biggest effect really on the planet, um, we've all perfected what they did and we've changed it, but those Italians that came to Wales by 88 <coughs> AD, Italy won, Wales nil, you know that score. Um, by the time they came here, and of course they were in England a lot earlier, they decided to build bases by sailing up the rivers on high tides and make trading defensive fortifications. Canovian is a classic in the Conway Valley at Caerheen. Obviously, Sigontium by the Seant in Carnarvon, uh, Brinkier, Tom and Amir, Pennell, all around the coast, and of course, the great community of Diva. And just before we lose the picture, that's a modern outline map. And of course, what we do know is the coastline here wasn't like this. Originally, from where West Kirby is, the land went straight up here towards Southport. The Mersey never entered the sea there when the Romans first came here. And discovered out there, where there's now a wind turbine farm, are the remains of a Roman trading port, which is never uncovered, even at low tide. Also, there's a small stream, I can't remember the name of it, just coming out here at the head of the Mersey estuary, and along that are four Roman training camps. And then we have Roman farms on the Wirral, and of course here on the doorstep with Prostatin, we've got evidence of Roman villa, and limestone kilns, and other things as well. So the Romans were here, they built, once they conquered, a series of roads. Here's the A55. I bet they never caused hold-ups like we do. <laughs> um, and of course the main road going from Chester down through past Baller Lake, Corwin that way, and then the coastal route from Sigontium. But that's just the very limited map of Roman occupation. They had marching camps, fortifications and works right across North Wales. And although we don't have any real detailed documentation, we know they were here collecting silver, gold, possibly copper, definitely lead, and of course the most important item of all, all of us couldn't survive a single day without it, manganese. 
manganese in the earth is what makes and helps plants to grow and it actually helps you survive and fight a lot of illnesses. You don't believe me, you go and look in an encyclopedia or on the internet at manganese. We all need it in our systems to survive. So they must have been here for quite a period of time taking the minerals away. We know they came up the River Clwyd. Next picture. <coughs> so when we look at the delta, is that a bit out of focus? Looks a bit out of focus. When we come to the delta, the Clwyd delta, there we are. Can you recognise it? Yeah. 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 Melodin in the foreground. Yeah. I'm up on the big hill where the um, TV masts and everything yeah. are. Here's Rill. Great Orm over there, Colwyn Bay, coming around to Abigail and Pensan, and then obviously Moira Isab, Moira Ichav, and then the hills of Snowdonia beyond. So there's the Great Delta. It's the largest delta in North Wales. It's a floodplain. Before we, I'm, I'm going to work backwards, but I've got to say this now. Before the mainline railway was built along the coast, from Talacra through Prostatin and Rill and on to Kimmel Bay and Pensan, that would flood regularly. The railway built three levels of uh, tidal banks. First level, you drive along if you drive along the prom at uh, Rill. That's actually built on the original bank. The clue to it is when you come past the old Alexandra Hospital, you'll notice the hospital is down below the road. Because that was originally a tidal bank. A second one was by the railway, and a third one was the land side of the railway as well. There were triple action sluices. There were a lot of culverts. Most of that's been obliterated now, it's been built on. So you're sitting on a disaster area. We only need a tsunami. <laughs> Luckily, we've got the Irish Sea, so it breaks because if it's like a big pond, it doesn't get those type of storm waves. But as we saw in 1991 and 1923, this area floods regularly, and you can see the shape of it, and you can see why. Okay, next picture, please. <coughs> right, St. Asaph, Clanelwy, and of course it's got a great history. I don't need to tell you the history, I'm sure some of you live there. And of course the important thing is, the river that runs through the centre of St. Asaph is not the Clwyd, it's the Elwy. The Elwy is the only river in North Wales that, for the majority of its route, runs across a bedding of limestone. All the way from Clan Gurnew, through Clan Salmon, Clan by TH, all the way, all the way the distance and all its feeders, the Alid and all the others that are coming in, the majority of those rivers are running on limestone. And the clue to that is that's where all the caves are in North Wales. Many of them. The town itself has developed at a crossing point of the Elwy, but there is some evidence, and we've had recent excavations, that the Romans had a roadway through here. We think this road, going to Bettison Rose, is partly on that route. So we're looking at a community that goes back a long way in history. Unlike Prostatin and Rill. Yeah? So this is important. Just north of the town is where the Clwyd and the Elwy come together, and we enter that floodplain that you saw on the previous picture. Okay, next one. <coughs> and there we are, a high tide, recent picture. It shows the evidence of what can happen. Most of the time, the river's contained within two banks, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But when you get extreme tides, you're going to get them in about four weeks' time. Uh, I gather the figures I've looked at on the Liverpool tide tables. And we, are, we are getting one 11.3 metre tide. So these marshy areas will flood. Yes. Right? But of course the river is controlled since it was canalised. Who started the canalisation? Well, we all think it was Edward I. No, the Romans, we know, dredged part of the river way before then, probably in about 120 AD, as it was in its original existence. We know also, later after the Romans, the Vikings were here for periods of time. The clue is the names in the area. So let's go on to the next picture. Let's just have a look at what's actually happened. So what you see is a river running along the base outcropping rock of Ridland, the community. From that <coughs> point on the other side, we've got the flatlands. And we've now got a river there that's controlled by tidal 
dikes, and there's a whole series of them to this day. It's not the only river that's gone through that in North Wales. The Conway has had it happen. The Seance has had it happen. The Kevney on Anglesey has been controlled even more than the Cluid. That's almost canalised for about 15 miles. Here, we're only talking about four miles altogether. But the idea behind the canalisation is to have a deep water channel at low tide that could take a draft of a ship up to 10 or 12 feet deep. So the ships could get to the base of the community. Not Edward the First Castle, you had an earlier Mott Bailey Castle here before then. But the idea was these fortifications could be serviced from the sea. And when you look at the later development of castles around the coastline of Wales, they're all built on tidal estuaries. They could easily be reached at a high tide. Next picture. <coughs> and there's another clue. Now, I've mentioned Ordnance Survey, and if you know your Ordnance Survey maps well, they tell you a lot of stories, not just the current detail that's out there. I've highlighted on here the route of a county boundary. <coughs> See how well you know your history. So what's the county on this side of that boundary? And what's the county on the other side? Carnarvon, brilliant. Carnarvon was the largest county in North Wales. Stretched all the way down to Mahunthleth, all the way across to Corwin, all the way up to this area across the Denby Moors. Pockets of it were separated. But Colwyn Bay was in Carnarvonshire. And, and Better Sequoia and all these places were Carnarvonshire. Of course, today that's all changed because we've got a new county now, Conwy. <coughs> and of course, I live where I live in Clamboveck and I live in part of the old Gwynedd. When they created Conwy, they had to take a few parishes from the surrounding counties to create that new established unitary authority. But there's a clue in that boundary. Can you see the shape of it? That's where the river used to go. Not where it goes here. There was a channel there because there were tidal channels all over this area. But notice the other clue on the map. Much of the drainage is in straight lines because over the centuries it's been controlled. I remember surveying some new houses here on St Asaph Avenue in Kimble Bay or Towing and a chap had bought a house and he said to me, why is that big ditch behind our house? I said, well, didn't your solicitor tell you? It's a tidal drain. And it can take a tidal action of up to 10 metres. He's looking at it, it's overgrown and it's got a little trickly mud yeah. ditch at the bottom. And of course, all along the edge of the Cluid here, there are triple action sluices which are automatically activated by the tide coming in. And that's when these drains start to soak up that extra water. But that tells us a lot of clues, and it also shows us something else. The road is almost straight. And of course, it's way before Edward the First Castle that a causeway had been created across the flatlands here. And land had been reclaimed and of course, I hope you know, it's one of the richest areas for agriculture. Mineral deposits here are high. It is excellent for growing crops. And of course, the whole area has benefited from that. Next picture. <coughs> when we see the church on the rise there, and of course you have got some red sandstone in this area, not a great deal of it. And of course, that's another peculiarity of the Vale of Cluid. If you go west from here, there's no red sandstone anywhere else in North Wales. But you will see buildings made of it. It's actually being brought across, either from the Vale or from Chester. The railway is the classic. All along the railway route, there are bridges faced in red sandstone. No red sandstone of any great deal in the area. And of course, when we look at the river here, now that you're so used to it, and it's been like that for hundreds of years, we think that's what it was always like. But no, this is a floodplain that would flood everywhere. Next one. 
and there's the crops. And of course, farming is going through a lot of changes at the moment. I even remember seeing a thing years ago in 1984 where a proposal was made by Cardiff that eventually there would be a fluid city here on these flats with an airport. Do you remember that? And it was going to be next to Glen Cluid Hospital, linked to the A55 dual carriageway. Well, thankfully, so far, it hasn't happened. So. Okay, next picture. <coughs> and as you follow the river down, of course, you come to this situation, which has had vast changes, certainly since the 1790s. The canalized river basically filtered out through the sand dunes here, there was a deep water channel into the sea, but what's happened is that famous engineer Savin changed everything. Masses of development was going on in Liverpool through the centuries, and those links between Liverpool and North Wales can't be forgotten about. They've altered every community along the coast. Liverpool grew from 1207, when it got its charter from King John, and gradually Every area along the North Wales coast was providing raw material, sending fruit, agricultural products, um, vegetables, and livestock through to Liverpool as well. And it was Savin that developed the harbour here of what we now call Vorid. He bought two paddle steamers in the early 1800s and he was shipping material across. And then by 1860, the railway down the Vale of Cluid was built to bring agricultural produce and timber up to Vorid as quickly as possible because the growth of Liverpool was phenomenal. Next picture. <coughs> so when you see that picture, and even that's out of date because obviously we've had the recent um, changes here, the river originally didn't enter the sea there. It went right along what we now call the sunny sands of Rill and all the amusement arcades and everything, all that never existed obviously. Um, I did see a census, you can probably um, quote me different, but I saw a census 1821 for Brill, the fishing community, and it actually had a population of just under 600 of it. Yeah? And then there's another record which I thought was phenomenal. The railway along the coast as far as Bangor opened in 1850 and across to Anglesey over the Britannia Bridge by 1852, but a train arrived in Brill Station on August Bank Holiday Monday, 1861, or a number of trains, August Bank Holiday, 1861, and it divulged six and a half thousand people on one day. <laughs> Visitors to Rill. From a period of Romans to Edward I and later kings, Henry III, and on to the Leicesters, the river has been affected considerably by the changes that have happened. Because I look at your picture here, there's a picture at the front here, of the old Ridland station. I remember seeing one of the Radio Land Cruise trains going through there when I was about five years old. And of course it's Aldi's now, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, change happens all the time. It's one of the things a lot of us don't like. Okay, next picture. <coughs> and there's the railway that really runs almost parallel to the, uh, the River Cluid, all the way up. There's the Vorid Pier area, and that's what it was constructed for, that railway, to take goods from the lower end of the valley. Some of the richest families in the UK lived here. I'm sure you know that yourselves. Certainly the Salisbury's, very wealthy. John Salisbury from the 1500s was a knight of the bedchamber of Elizabeth I. I can't work that one out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Uh, and of course, many other families. And, the, um, and there's a whole list, and I, I think the classic, I, I, we've all got our favourites in periods of history. To me, the classic, to me, the greatest Welshman that's ever lived is Humphrey Clewyd. From Foxhall, near Denby. I think it's unbelievable what this man did in one lifetime because he was dead by the age of 41. But he went to Oxford University at a younger age than most people. He was there at the age of 15. That's clever to start off with. Um, and eventually he worked with Lord Arundel who was the Chancellor of Oxford University 
and they set up what became the Royal Library in London. Eventually, he put together the start of the British Museum Library. He created the first true map of Wales, and then a map of the whole of the UK. He also wrote a book, Gwalia. You know Gwalia? The first true history of Wales using ancient manuscripts, and that's where the stories of Maddock discovering America come from. He finished his days in Denby, and of course he's buried in Whitchurch. White Parish Church, yeah. But the man did so much in a short lifetime. A five volume set on how to do operations on the male and female bodies in the 1500s. Yeah, so it's an amazing story. And there's so many others linked along this section of the river. Okay, next picture. <coughs> I'm proud of the Vale, and my family have been here for years. Um, and when we look at this, of course, next to our canalised river, we mustn't forget as well, there used to be, before all the development here, a railway line that was built to Kimmel Camp. And of course that is linked as well with the mutiny, where all the soldiers are buried in Bodmerton Church. Um, and of course that's a very sad story, but of course it also shows something else. Uh, and I think it's very important, we've just been through this 100th anniversary last autumn of the end of the First World War. Uh, a friend of mine, he may have come and spoken to you at some time, Dennis Roberts from Pema Mauer, he found a ledger, and this is, this is very unique, because the military and the politics tried to destroy <coughs> all military records from the First World War. They didn't want people to know. But he found a ledger, and it showed on the camp near Conwy, 16,000 soldiers arriving in um, uh, December from all over the country. Most of them arrived at midnight because they didn't want them to know where they were. They did their six to eight weeks training and they were over in Belgium and northern France by the end of January. And that list that came in on that week in December, it was December the 12th, they were all dead by the end of February. 16,000. Well, Kimmel Camp was providing people as well. So there's, there's these other things. And of course, time goes on, we forget about it, um, but they're very important. I feel very lucky that in my life, I've never had to fight in a major war. Um, and I think a lot of people, anybody that's sort of under the age of 70 can probably say that. There have been conflicts, I know, but, but that type of war is just so frightening. So a lot of the history linked to this canalisation of the river, you can still see it to this day, but sadly there's something wrong, isn't there? It's silted up at low tides, especially when you cross your bypass and look towards Vorid, there's great mud and sandbanks all the way up the river. Great for bird life, wildlife, fantastic, but it proves something. The river hasn't been dredged like it used to be years ago, and it was dredged so that sailing vessels, obviously not steam vessels, but sailing vessels, could get right up to the edge of Ridland and pick up goods and take people away. Just keep this in your mind now, okay? Pre-1760, 99.9% of people in Britain were born in a community or in the country. They grew up there, they lived their short life, and they died there. Nobody ever went anywhere. Most people were too scared to go over the hill. They didn't know what was there. And that's why religion became so successful. Because it could actually be something that protected people in their minds. But once railways came, everything changed. Next picture. And there's an old picture I know. It hasn't got the Sustrans double drawbridge. Right? It's um, a previous one of how it used to look. Um, the whole of the Vorid area, and of course this is dredged differently now, um, and you've got other moorings here, and they've put new coastal defences all the way along. You've even got the amusement arc arcade yeah, yeah, at um, Vorid, so it's a bit of history, you see, and it's changing all the time. Next picture. And the final one, just of a map of that area, let's not forget this. I was involved with the construction surveying the A55 when it was developed um, and one of the things I remember seeing was they had decided on the route to make sure that it was 25 metres above the floodplain. 
So when it comes down the Riyat Hill and on the bypass around St Asaf, past Bodden Wyvern, keeping to the edge of the hills up to Abergelly, and then on embankments around Abergelly, embankments all the way along this fine Flandullus, it's actually higher than the highest seas ever recorded. So they really don't care about you lot in here. <laughs> they made sure the road for the e Europeans and Irish never gets flooded. <laughs> I'll leave it with that. Next one. And I thought I'd better put this in. Um, because it's the oldest seaside resort steam railway in the country. It first opened in 1911. So it's a classic, isn't it? And it's still running. I know it's closed for a period of time. Next one's the same, I think. This one out focus on. So great to have that. That's quite unique. There are many around the country, but this is the oldest one. Okay. Okay, next picture. Uh, onto the... So I finished there to show that. I don't need to tell you the history of the castle. You all know that. And there's some wonderful books. I hope those of you really into history have got these two. There's the History of Clued and Powys, which is the Royal Commission pocket guide, okay, which is brilliant. You remember the big, thick Royal Commission books? Well, all the main details are in these. A whole series of these covering the whole of Wales. And then, obviously, although it's out of date, the Archaeology of Clued is a classic. And if you're into old houses, this is your Bible, because it lists all the most important houses across this area. Next picture. Um, and I'll leave you with that. When's it going to flood again? <laughs> well, Flandidno is the same, because when you stand on the pier at Bangor with some Bangor eyes, they always say this. They say, you see Flandidno? Look, they've put windmills on it to lift it out of the sea. <laughs> <laughs> Next one, please. You should have a gap. Oh, I've put a map in there, right. Yeah, I just quickly wanted to point out because you should know this. Right. If you know your landscape, it's your local area in North Wales. Five counties, obviously Flintshire with Wrexham Myler, Denbyshire, Conwy, <coughs> Gwynedd, Unismon, and Northern Powys. In that area, there has been masses, and I mean masses over the years, of coastal protection, estuarine protection and control. Many of these rivers um, the Malvac, the, the, sorry, the Malvac, the Dovey, the Decini, uh, certainly the rivers up to Comprisor, past Trasfunid, um, the Duivor, Seant, certainly the Kevney, and one or two others on Anglesey, they're not natural. They haven't been natural for hundreds of years. And of course the Dee itself, which starts in the hills above Lintegid, Valor Lake, flowing out, when it gets to Huntingdon at Chester, 17 million gallons are pumped out of it every hour. Where's it going? By pipeline to Warrington, St Helens and the east side of Liverpool and Altrincham and Stockport in Manchester. And that's been going on for over 50 years. So the River Dee is what we call one of the biggest regulation schemes in the country. A lot of water is feeding millions of people. Okay, next picture please. Next picture. Okay, these people, I said Italy won a Wales nil. Well, of course, what they taught us is something maybe you never think about it, but you're doing it now as you sit in this room together. They taught us working together as a group. They, I know the TV and everything's full of all this rubbish of politics at the moment. But they actually talk and taught us the politic of you're good at making cakes. You're good at making a door. You're good at making a path. You're good at the science. That's what the Romans taught us. You bring together the specialities of people and make them work in a group. That's the true meaning of politic. You politically work together as a management unit. And you're doing it in here on the subject you're interested in. But they taught us much more. They taught us the bloody building we're sitting in. Rectangular corners, gable roofs, they went all across the European area and we even know to this day that most of the United States of America have copied the Roman way. Grid patterns of streets, trading centres in the middle, entertainments around the outside, urban, suburban and protection right around the outside of that. 
they've affected the whole world. And the word Wales comes from a Latin word, which means foreigner. <laughs> That's the truth. So these people have had a major effect. Next picture, please. <coughs> they conquered all of the <laughs> tourist area of Europe. <laughs> this picture isn't in focus very much. It's terrible. But it basically shows you what they did. In a period of between four and five hundred years, it's the longest existing empire really that's ever been. And of course, how did they do it? Well, they knocked the hell out of everybody. <laughs> and we as British people learned something from that because for hundreds of years we went around the world doing that as well. <laughs> so we've got nothing to be proud of, okay? <clears throat> but what's important is it shows on that shaded map what they achieved with their methods during that time. The growth is from about 300 BC. By the time we get to 100 BC, they've developed navies, military occupation, they've developed the politic, but they've also developed the things like drainage, road construction, producing crops and animal foodstuffs to keep themselves alive so they could actually manage an area. And of course, their military campaigns were clever. Their shipping was not good. They hugged the coastlines. Their ships were not ideal for crossing oceans. But they certainly could support their action with their navies. Because we know that from Porchester on the south coast of England. That was their main base for their naval squadrons. And they could operate from there, round the east coast, round the west coast, even to Ireland, and certainly along what we now call the... So they had the ability to manage, control, and it's a unified action where all of you work together to make that work. We have it today. We call it parish councils, county councils, <laughs> national <laughs> parliament. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's still the same thing. Whether you agree with it or not, it came from this period and it showed the power and strength. <coughs> Next picture. And I love this picture. This painting's in the Canolvan in Beaumaris, and it shows a Roman fleet of galleys attacking the coast of Anglesey. Now, this lot down here are wondering what the heck's going to happen. They're, you know, it's artistic license. They've got, they've got metal helmets, it's Bronze Age or whatever, I don't know. And there's the Welsh hills beyond. Now, when you would see something like that, can you imagine all you've seen, like, something like a little coracle or something like that, and suddenly this thing arrives. Yeah? You know, it's like somebody decided to land a jumbo jet on the flats just beyond Redland. It's, you know, it's so strange. But of course, it changed everything. Next picture. And of course, when we talk the D, this is the diorama in the Grosvenor Museum in Chester. If you've not been in there, it's well worth a visit, because Chester, probably of all the Roman cities in Britain, they have got more artefacts and more remains in the city than probably any other city to do with that period. Here's our River Dee. The street names are still the same. If you walk down the streets, there's Watergate Street, there's Northgate Street. And all. So the actual shape and structure of Chester is still there. But of course the centuries of change have come about. It is thought this whole area where the Rudy Racecourse is was a large open area that would flood at high tide. So it was a very secure area to bring ships into. And the Dee was a tidal river. At this time, the Mersey wasn't. Next picture. <coughs> so when we look at that Chester we know today, which a lot of its structure dates back well over a thousand years, but there's Roman... Underneath all these buildings, there's Roman remains, Roman walls, dating back certainly to 1 AD, and maybe a bit before then. Um, so it's a classic site. An estimate that Francis Lynch, the archaeology historian from Bangor University, actually came up with, she said, looking at the growth of the city, it's possible at its peak, around about 200 AD, it may have had a population of 10,000 people. That is a lot of people then. Yeah? So it's, a, it's got everything we think about today. You know, supply, 
um, organization, road, street, shops, everything. It's got it all there all those years ago. Okay, next one. <coughs> and then along the coast, as we go through the centuries, of course, there's other development. Here's one of the Princes of Gwynedd's Castle. You've all been there. Yulo. Oh, yeah. A series of castles across the hills, Yulo and others. Um, Dizeth, obviously, and right the way across. Um, so we've got these periods of history that change, but something's happening. While this is all happening, the D is gradually silting up. That's the important point. Next one. <coughs> and when we come to Chester to look at its history, um, I'm sure you've all stood on the D bridge. Have you the old bridge on the River D? Right, well, there's a sluice here. A sluice, weir, and the first one was constructed there, amazingly enough, in 1007. That old because there were a series of mills along the edge here where people go and sit now and listen to bands playing and they wanted fresh water control to the mills at high tides the tide would flood all the way up almost to Ruaban another 25 miles inland they didn't want salt water in their processes of milling so they put a sluice in all those years ago to control the fresh water and stop the tidal water going up the majority of days obviously an extreme high tide will cross the top of that so we've had a sluice there for a long time. And then in the 1700s, a water pumping station was put in. This was raised some more. More controls were put in place. And this is where water was extracted for the city and surrounding countryside. Next bit. Oh, the bridge takes back to about 600 AD. So there's the weir as you know it today. And I think it's only probably, I'm, I'm guessing a bit, but probably twice a month maybe, that the tide reaches above that line. So obviously there's a difficulty for boats, but in the old days it is thought, because all along the D to Ruaban are Roman fortifications. They must have been served by the river. So on high tides, ships would have sailed right around. Okay, next one. And we've got to talk the industry, because this is the big kick that made the D become an act of parliament to be canalised. When we look at that very basic diagram, and it is basic, we just see a number of productions. Coal, lead, copper, slate, woolens, ironworks. Well, of course, the big richness, the large richness of Wales is under the ground. Yeah. Everything. Limestone, sandstone, all the different elements that are needed for much of what became the Industrial Revolution later. But look at the the gathering of industrial sites along the edge of the D. In 1902, between Point of Air and just south of Chirk, there were 104 active coal mines in North Wales. That's racing on a bit. But a lot of that coal went to Manchester, to the cotton industry, a lot of it went to Liverpool to fire the ships crossing the Atlantic and going right around the world. So that coal production was very important, but we're going back in time. Next one, please. <coughs> and what were the ships like in the early days? Well, this is the Middle Ages and a bit later. This is the slice of painting, but it shows the type of vessels that operated around the North Wales coast. They're very basic. Some of them may have weighed up to 200 tonnes, the bigger ones, but the majority of these were designed with very strong hulls to be beached. So they could carry their load into an estuary, run up on a mud bank, wait for the tide to go, horses and carts come out and meet them, empty the ship, and the ship would wait there for the tide to come back in and they could be floated again. That type of vessel was operating right around the British Isles for about 500 years. So that is a common practice before we had proper harbours. Next picture. I think there's a few of these just to illustrate these types of ships. Um, and it just goes to show, and there's a development in the type of shipping. So the D estuary, more than the Cluid, had a lot of this type of vessels starting to work up to Chester, Parkgate, Neston, Flint, all the way along the estuary, shipping was working. Yeah? Okay, next one. I think there's two or three of these. And then, of course, larger vessels developed. And I think one of the classic things, can I throw this in, it's not to do with the D, but Mary Jones, who trained um, seamen in Carnarvon in navigation and mathematics, 
she trained many of the greatest captains this country's ever had. You've heard of ships like the Cutty Sark and the Thermopylae. Many of the captains of those ships started here in North Wales. They learned their trade on these types of vessels and eventually worked on the great tea clippers going to India and going to South America and all that sort of thing. So it's an amazing history. North Wales is a maritime area. Very important. Next one. <coughs> so we come round from the D and we come to, a lot later, the Grove and the Bridge, which has still got the longest arch of stone in Britain. It's 200 feet from bank to bank. It's not the highest, but the longest, um, designed by the architect Harrison. Next picture should take us round the corner. Uh, oh no, we're going to show you this. Right, okay. So, you've got to put this into a, a sort of picture. There's a lot of merchants based in Chester who trade with other parts of the country. They are working on the industry in North Wales. They are buying and selling and trading across the Irish Sea to Ireland. Coal and all these other products. This river is silting up. Something has to be done. Next picture. I think there's a few just to illustrate. That's an old coal mine that was near Killins, Ulo, years ago. Next one. Five through these quickly. And then we come around the corner under the Rudy Bridge. This is the railway bridge where a section collapsed in 1847 in the river. I think eight people died. Uh, and of course it was built of cast iron. And the Board of Trade Inquiry said no longer could bridges of that size be built of cast iron. They implicitly said it had to be wrought iron and the early stages of steel as well. Then the river comes up here, through this area, this is where the Rudy Racecourse is, it comes up through this area here and suddenly we have a change. Can you see that bank on the map mm -hmm. up there? Next picture. I think we see the bridge, that's the railway bridge but that's the more modern one. Next one. And we come to this. Now we're on Sealand Road. Do you know that road going into yeah. Chester where all the industrial yeah. and out of town shops are? Mm -hmm. right. And you're looking at a bund. This is a defensive bund to change the route of the river. Originally the river, <laughs> this is the wealthy people for you, was the boundary between England and Wales. <laughs> but the Dukes of Westminster lived in Cheshire for many hundreds of years and they didn't want their estates in Wales. Primitives, you see. <laughs> so they moved the boundary. And it only joins the D further on. So it's what we call an unidentified boundary. Undefined. But when you look at this here, we're standing on this big bank, which is now a park, and just there is a little ditch going off. Next picture. That is where the D used to go. Right. In, eight, in 1732, uh, 20 entrepreneurs, merchantmen, owners of industrial sites in North Wales and other businesses across the North West managed to get an Act of Parliament to canalise the River D for eight miles from Chester to Connors Quay. Sorry, correct name, O'Connors Quay. That's his correct one. Next picture. And it takes a 90 degree turn from where it used to go. And here it is, going towards Saltney. That is completely, I'm sure women were involved, man-made. It's eight miles long. At low tide, it was between 16 and 20 foot deep. So vessels of up to... 150 tons could still come up the river because it had reached the point they couldn't reach Chester anymore. So they started the work in 1732. Let's get this clear in our heads. No JCBs, no railways, no decent roads. They're talking about pickaxes, shovels, wheelbarrows and horses and carts to create an eight mile channel nearly 20 foot deep at low tide, with first level, second level and third level defensive tidal banks all the way along it. It took 60 years. Next picture. When we get to Saltney, it changes direction again. I'm sure you all know Saltney. It doesn't look like that now. Every space on there is full of buildings. 
That's all yeah. changed completely. There's the railway junction between the Great Western <coughs> and the London North Western, or what originally was the Chester and Holyhead Railway. Here's the canalised D. And when we come to here, because they canalised it, there used to be fords crossing this flat delta. So they had to create ferries. That's why this is called Saltney Ferry. Oh, yes. And that's why the next one along is called Queen's Ferry. Because originally there was fording points across the flat areas at low tide. Next picture. Saltney is there. We're coming this way. The remains of the first level bank is there washed away. That um, worries. Here's the second level tidal bank. Similar on that side and then there's a third level. All this land to the north of the river was reclaimed. And of course it's one of the richest agricultural areas in this area. And they named it Sealand. <laughs> because it's the reclaimed estuary. So that's where that name originates. Next one please. And there it is. It's a straight line. So next time you cross the Queen's Ferry Bridge over the D and you look along it, just look how straight it is. It's totally man-made. From my research through the years, I think it's about the largest project of its type that had taken place in the whole of Europe up to that date. From the 1790s onwards, masses of canalisation went on all over the world. And of course, eventually leading to Suez Canal, the yeah. Panama yeah. Canal, and that sort of thing. But this is actually draining an area that flooded and creating one deep water channel. All this area out here towards Kinnerton and um, one or two other villages, that used to flood years ago. But now, of course, it's controlled. Next picture. And of course, this helped the businesses and industry along until, in 1963, they opened the bypass that didn't lift and open and that killed the shipping trade that's the Queen's Ferry Bypass of course we still have one vessel that comes along here regularly at the moment carrying the wings of the A380 Airbus but of course they've stopped production of that now so that's probably something else there won't be ships so you only get small vessels like this next one you recognize this one now here's the abutments of the original toll gate drawbridge that used to cross here. It's been another bridge before this steel one. And that was a lifting drawbridge. But it's got no mechanism in it anymore, obviously to let ships through. Next one. Oh, and next. Go again. Oh, we come to the end of that rack. Okay. It's hot in here, isn't it? Isn't it hot? You sure you want to stay here? Don't you want to go home? <laughs> okay, press button. <laughs> Not so many slides this time. <laughs> okay. And at that point, we've got to mention now, so this canal is developed between 1732 and into the early 1800s. It's certainly complete virtually by 1800. But of course, the other thing that's happening is, Liverpool has now grown by 1800 into the biggest port in the world. Seven and a half miles of docks on the Liverpool side, four and a half miles of docks on the Birkenhead side. Um, do you know Birkenhead's named after the river that joins the Mersey there? It's called the River Birket. That's why it's Birkenhead, right? The Birkett Head. That's where that comes to. I've just put that in Albert Dock to show that development of all the dock plans that took place. And of course, Liverpool now has taken all the trade. Chester will never become a trading city like it was. Next picture, please. <coughs> and of course, this frontage that we all know so well, it was about to go through even bigger changes. And some of the fleets in the world were based here. Uh, Blue Funnel, and of course Manchester Line is operated from Manchester, the Manchester Ship Canal, but the growth was enormous. Next one. Um, and the Birkenhead docks are very important as well, because that now links with the D at Queen's Ferry and Deeside. Very important, this link now. And this, there may be one or two people in this room that have been involved with that link. Okay, next picture. That's what we call the West Float and the East Floats of Birkenhead. They were deep water docks and they could take heavy 
merchant ships coming in. And of course we've got railway expansion that's happening from the craziness of the 1840s through to the 1870s, what they call the railway mania, railways being built everywhere. And of course a railway eventually was built from Birkenhead, linking Liverpool, down through Shotton, down to Wrexham, and up to the new steelworks. The steelworks that John Summers bought land in the 1870s, one guinea an acre. <laughs> he bought 100 acres. And in the 1890s, him and his son bought another 400 acres and developed, next picture, the largest steelworks in the UK for a period of time. Obviously, it was known as Shot and Iron Works in the early days. There's the river, there's the railway crossing the bridge that linked. The reason he chose there was because they wanted lots of water, they wanted shipping to take steel and iron away, and they wanted a link with the railway because they had contracts with Norway to bring masses of iron ore <coughs> down to Shot and Steelworks through Birkenhead docks. Next picture. There's the old head office, John Summers. And I think I'd love to quote this. I'm a real patriot for our country. In the year 1956, Shot and Steelworks produced more steel than any other steelworks in the whole of Europe. More than those great valleys in Germany, the Rhine and the Ruhr, and other places across Europe, but they were producing more steel here than anywhere. Employing 12,500 men, it was a massive production. Next picture, I've got some aerial shots, and it shows the growth. That's where the head office was. These are the other plants. And then the next picture again shows the roller mills and all the others, and the river. Oh, sorry, that's upside down. The river's there next to it. They had docks and jetties and everything serving because they had to bring in limestone, they had to bring in. Um, the iron ore, the raw iron ore, and they needed ships, not just railways, to take the products away. Another thing to be proud of, in that year 1956, near Wrexham, Ply Main Colliery was the deepest colliery ever dug in Britain. Its two shafts were the height of Snowdon under the ground, 3,560 feet, and in 1956, I feel so proud of this because I've got Welsh blood in my veins. <laughs> Clyde Colliery produced more coal in that year than any other colliery in the whole of the British Isles. Six and a half thousand collieries in Britain. And it was the most successful. And this steelworks was the most successful as well. 1956. Next picture. And of course today, it's a shade of what it was. All right? It's now basic, what's left there is a coating plant. It doesn't make steel. They coat steel. If you use a fridge, if you use a cooker, if you go to B&Q or any of these places, or you drive a car, it goes through this coating process with paints. And that's what they do there now. Okay, next one. So by the river, it's very industrial. Most of the industry is on the north side of the river here. So the south is the suburban areas, and of course, D side, and Flint and all these places, Connors Key, grew with the growth of this industry. That railway bridge, which the railway is still operating from Birkenhead and West Kirby and uh, New Brighton to Wrexham, that's the longest turning swing bridge in Britain. 184 feet from end to end. Unfortunately, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Next one. Let me finish now. So look, look at this growth. What we see as growth has happened because of the canalisation of the river. Raw material can be brought in by ship and rail and the products can be taken out. And this great growth of urban areas is because of that canalisation. Next one. We're getting near the end in case anybody's wondering. Here's an old picture of the original O'Connor's Quay. And he was a shipping magnet from Dublin, and he invested in two coal mines in North of Hall, and then he invested in other businesses along the banks of the Canal ISD, became a very successful businessman. Next picture. <coughs> There's the harbour he developed at Connors Quay. He had brickworks, limeworks, he made tiles and chimney pots, he also made a lot of pottery, and then eventually he invested with two other businessmen into a railway 
that we call the Rex and Mould and Connors Quay, which serviced all of Buckley Mountain, bringing the goods down to the docks. Next picture. Buckley Mountain eventually had, from Connors Quay, right up to the top, and down to Buckley Junction, 17 brickworks. You're surrounded by their products. You only have to walk out this door. Yellow chimney pots, cream chimney pots, yellow bricks, cream bricks, lintels, doorsteps. Everything was made. And they've gone all over the world, these bricks. So the river played its part. Next one. I'm conscious of time. And that whole area of Buckley Mountain, all of it, Mancott, Sandycroft, Buckley itself, Ulo, was absolutely invested in. Coal, coke, every product you can imagine, being fed by tramways down to the river and docks all the way along it. Next one. And there's Buckley Mountain as it used to look. Uh, the Knoll Hill Brickworks was the last one that closed. The Buckley Mountain Colliery was here. But there's brickworks everywhere, right? And they were all very productive. And of course, if you know the history of here, it had its own language. It was a Staffordshire Welsh. Because <laughs> many workers from Staffordshire came to work here in the potteries and the brickworks. They intermingled and married with the Welsh ladies and everything. And a strange language appeared. And thankfully, that language has been recorded. And we can't understand them. <laughs> it's an amazing language. Especially to Buckley. Nowhere else. Okay, next one. And there's the bridge with the railway line going on to Wrexham. Of course, it's still open, but that was the reason the Summers bought their land here. They needed the rail link and the river link. Next one. And, of course, that rail link spread across the whole of the UK, not just Wales. If you, I'm just going to pick at random. If you go to Blackpool, which is the largest seaside resort in Europe, population over 400,000, if you go to Bournemouth, if you go to Eastbourne, but if you go to Barmouth, Bala, Blyna Festiniog, Huilog, Menai Bridge or Holyhead, you will see Buckley products everywhere, Ruaban products, the shiny red Dennis bricks, everywhere, Warrington Blues, everywhere, it's the rail system that changed it all. But our River D had a big input in that. I remember walking down one of the main streets in Glasgow a few years ago, and there's Buckley chimney pots and bricks everywhere. <laughs> That's how big it was. Okay, next one. Nearly finished. And the final bridge when you cross is this one. I wish they'd named it the Welsh Harp. I think that's quite appropriate. And of course we've got a change that's about to happen. This new link from this bottom road coming up the hill to join the A55. So to relieve the Aston Hill, where you go down yeah. amongst the slow traffic, that's going to start very shortly. It's only six and a half miles, but this quiet bridge where I'm standing in the middle taking a picture and there's no traffic <laughs> is all about to change. Okay, next one. So that's the last bridge. Next picture. And standing on that bridge, there's our canalised D coming out past Connors Quay Gas Power Station. Okay? So that's what they did. They created a deep water channel to service Chester. The books say, the engineering book I've got here, say when it was complete, that canalisation, it actually was falling into disuse 50 years after being complete. It was silting up. So it's a story of big ideas that eventually, like everything, go west. Yeah. Next one, nearly finished now, I think. Um, there's the gas-fired power station. Obviously, that's on the banks, and it uses water from the river. Cooling process. <coughs> Next one. And Flint itself got to mention it um, because it grew with this history of the river. It's an industrial community. Somebody said once, it's the ugliest town in Wales. Isn't that cruel? They wouldn't say that about Cardiff, would they? No, isn't that cruel? Okay, next one. A few little snippets for you. Um, the original, I'm going to watch a bunch of, I know this is a poor map. Over here is Burton Point. And that's where the River Dee used to enter the estuary. Not here, where it's canalised. So that's the massive change. There's two miles difference between the canalised 
and where the main channel used to be. So it's quite a project, yeah. Next one. And again, go and move on, we're nearly finished. Let's get to the end. A few little funnies. Now, there's a clue to the de-estuary. When you drive along the coast road, which I'm sure a lot of you do, Talacro, Mostyn, all the way along, many of the pubs have maritime links. There's many. The steam packet, the ferry, that sort of thing. That shows the clue of the history of the D. Next one. And I've got a nice one coming up in a moment. So here's Hollywell and the Greenfield Valley. And of course over here we have the Greenfield Basin. Next picture. And there's a classic document. The document is dated 1110. It's handwritten. It's written by some monks from the area of Basingwork Abbey and Whitford. And it's listing the casks of wine produced in North Wales. Going to Calais, Brittany. Yes! Welsh wine going to Northern France. What a way to finish. And it went out of the Greenfield Basin. Isn't that wonderful? Next one. Next one. We didn't finish. Okay. Um, and then we come to the point of air, and obviously we've got the gas refinery here now, but that's where the last coal mine used to be. And of course it closed in 2003, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and obviously an end of another industry, that coal production. Okay, let's finish. We've just got some sunsets over here. Um, come back to there. If you live here, I hope you recognise you live in a very attractive, beautiful community. Yeah. If I stuck you in Birmingham and said you've got to live there for a year, you'd suddenly die. <laughs> because look, look at what you've got. Hills and countryside, coastline, bits of history, all of it. It's very attractive. Uh, next one. And just remember that. All this great conquest and change started with these people. Yeah. It's amazing to think that Italy now gone the same way as Greece. It's bankrupt. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing the changes that happen in history. Okay, next one. I think we've got sunsets. So we just have a bit of sun. Yeah. Um, North Wales is a beautiful area, folks. And you've got it all on your doorstep. Next one. Yeah. Um, of course, we're on the north-facing coast, and the sun is now setting yeah. further round to the west. So you get these stunning sunsets. Yeah. And the last one is in the hills. <coughs> and that's over Talislin Lake, down near Dolgethlai Way. That's it. Anyway, I hope you've learned something. A few laughs. Educational, but I hope it's been worth coming out to see. Thank you very much. Well, Michael has uh, pretty much said all that I was going to say. Uh, amusing, educational, and uh, I'm sure that uh, we've all learnt something this evening. Um, you mentioned Flint and you mentioned Cardiff. If they spent as much money on Flint as they spent on Cardiff, then I'm sure Flint would be a more beautiful place to live than it is. But there we are. So, Michael, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Pleasure. We've. I, and I'm sure everybody else, has thoroughly enjoyed what you've, uh, what you've told us to see. 230,000 years ago, right up to date. I know. Before, uh, before we shuffle around and uh, uh, tea is produced, I think uh, Hayden wants to do the rough. Most important. How many about six, I think. Okay. I didn't see that.